Yes. Did you bring your sword with you? We are continuing here this evening uh, with our series entitled Christian Conduct 101. This is lesson number seven. We have a couple more lessons that we want to give in this series, and then we'll conclude. And let's see. uh, Guys, are we rolling on the live stream? We should have a couple Texans watching tonight. Brother Kirk and Sister Jody, what 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 camera are we on, guys? Are we we're back here? All right. Well, today is Brother Kirk's birthday, so could everybody give Brother Kirk a big howdy? <laughs> uh, I don't know if Brother Kirk's talking like that yet, but happy breath, birthday, Brother Kirk. We love and appreciate you guys. Oh my goodness. All right, lesson number seven. And tonight we're going back to the book of Romans. In fact, we're going to go back to the very same passage that we started out with last week. And, uh, but now here this week, we're going to head in a completely another direction. Uh, let's go back to Romans chapter 12, verses number 1 and number 2. And again, the Apostle Paul is speaking here. And he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a what? Living sacrifice. How many will remember last week's lesson? That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And we talked about that. It's not above and beyond the call of duty, but it's only our reasonable service. Verse number two, and do not be conformed to this world. Now I want you to Pay, pay attention to the wording here. We, we, we've got some words that I want us to hone in on here tonight. Do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed. Okay? So we see there that there's an opportunity to be conformed to this world, but then there's also an opportunity to be transformed by how? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, notice what Paul says here in verse number 2. Last week we talked about verse number 1, presenting your body as a living sacrifice. And I encourage you, if you weren't here uh, last week, to go back and to listen to that because that was a very, very important lesson for Christian living. But... Notice what Paul says here in verse number 2. He says that we are to be transformed, and we are to be transformed how? We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. By the renewing of our mind. So then, I guess the obvious question that remains is this. How do we renew our mind? How do we renew our mind? As humans, but more importantly, as believers, how do we renew our mind? How many know our mind is a terrible thing to waste? (laughs) Amen? How many understand each and every one of us have been given a mind? Right? You have one, I have one. But how many understand it's up to us to use it, to protect it? I've read before, and I should have looked this up, but I didn't think about it till right now, but I've read before how much the average human uses their mind, and it's a very small percentage. So a mind is a terrible thing to waste, isn't it? Both in the natural and in the spiritual as well. But... It's important to note here that both commands that we find here in verse number 2, both commands from the Apostle Paul are what we call passive. Everybody say passive. Both commands found here in verse number 2 given to us from the Apostle Paul are passive, meaning that we aren't the ones who are conforming or transforming our minds, but rather someone else is. 
Now, this is important. Now, this is important. We've got to catch this. And let me try to explain what we mean here. First of all, either the devil is conforming our minds to be like the world, or God is transforming our minds to be like his mind. Now, obviously, we get to choose who does what. But once we make that choice, then the process is set in motion. And again, that's why we say that these commands here by Paul are passive in nature. You see, a statement is passive when the subject of the sentence receives the action instead of performing it. Does that make sense? Let that sink in for a moment. Because I went into this lesson thinking that I was the one responsible for renewing my mind. But I found out different once I got into this. A statement is passive when the subject of the sentence, that would be us, receives the action instead of performing it. So then, as human beings who all of us have minds, like we've said, we're either being conformed to this world via demonic influence through television and music and media and so many things, we're either being conformed to this world or we're being transformed by the renewing of our mind through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that, my friend, is the only two options that we have in this world. The only two options. Either our spirit man is being fed on a daily basis, or our carnal nature is being fed on a daily basis. Now, obviously, God has a goal in mind, and that goal is for us to allow him to renew our minds And the reason why we need to have our (laughs) minds renewed is, number one, the fact that we live in a fallen world. How many realize we live in a fallen world? Reigns on the just and the unjust, right? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Amen? And so the reasons why our minds need to be renewed is, number one, We live in a fallen world. And then number two, the fact that we were born into sin. How many know that you were born into sin? We didn't have to do anything to be a sinner. We were just born that way, weren't we? So both of these reasons show us why our minds need to be renewed. And again, if our minds are not being renewed, then they're being conformed to the likeness of this world. How many know there is no in-between? We used to talk about straddling the fence, one foot over here and one foot over there. But how many know there is no such place as in-between? We're either for God or we're either against Him, right? We either live in the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness. So then, the reason why God wants to renew or to transform our minds is that He wants to convert our thoughts over to His thoughts. Does that make sense? And in doing so, he can bring his own plans and purposes into our lives. Think about that. And so what this means is the fact that God can never transform our lives until we first give him permission to transform our minds. Does that make sense? Can't change our life until he first changes our mind. How many know the mind is the first thing? The first thing of every action. How many understand my mind had to think to raise my hand, then it had to send the signal down through my arm and say, okay, raise your right hand. My mind. Wow, it's powerful, isn't it? But again, God can never transform our lives until we first give him permission to transform our minds. Every action we do as a human being is controlled by our mind. It's controlled by a thought. 
How many understand every action was conceived, it was born in your thought life, right? You had to think about it before you went and, and done it. And so that is why we must learn how to control our thoughts instead of our thoughts controlling us. Does that make sense? It's kind of like that, what the Bible says about money. Money isn't the root of all evil, it's the, the love of money. And so when we get these truths down, when we get these formulas in place, once we get the revelation of these processes, then we can understand better where we're at and why we lack and, and why we struggle. So then, we've got to learn how to control our thoughts so our thoughts don't control us. And the reason why, again, the reason why our thoughts are so important is because every word, every action is conceived with a thought. King Solomon said this in Proverbs chapter 23. He said, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And that, my friend, is why the devil wants inside our heads. How many know the enemy wants inside your head? He wants up here. The enemy knows that if he can, can control our mind, then he controls us, right? And that's why we've got to be so careful of what we allow into our mind. And how, and how do we allow things into our mind? Two ways, through our eye gates and through our ear gates. Remember the little song in Sunday school? Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. How many know that was more than just a cute little song? Yeah, but that's something we need to live by every day of our lives. So we've got to guard our mind. We've got to guard our thoughts. And we do that by filtering what we see and what we hear. Now look what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I was going to read, I was going to start at number 5, but guys, can we back it up to verse number 3? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 3. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of what? Strongholds. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. Not mighty in us, not mighty in the church that we attend, but mighty in God for pulling down of strongholds and casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now watch this. Bringing every thought. Everybody say every thought. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Wow. To the obedience of Christ. So then, if we don't allow God to transform us by the renewing of our minds, then I don't think that we will ever know the fullness of God, nor will we know the ways of God. Let's go back to the Old Testament here. Let's look in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 55. How many want to know the, the fullness of God? Do you want to walk in the fullness of God? Do you want to know the ways of God? Now that's important because they're not natural. They're not carnal. But look what the prophet Isaiah has said here. He says, the word of the Lord comes through the prophet and says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor... Are your ways my ways, says the Lord? For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts higher than your thoughts. How many are thankful tonight that you serve a God that's higher than you? <laughs> that's better than you? That's, that's bigger than you? 
more powerful than you. I'm thankful for that. And so this isn't a bad thing, but this is a good thing. But because of it, we need to understand some things. Now, we said it last week that sometimes we can get ourselves into trouble when we start thinking for God. How many have ever been guilty of thinking for God? Yeah. We get into trouble when we just presume that we know what the will of God is. But Isaiah just said it. He said his thoughts are not our thoughts. And how many know sometimes God likes to think outside the box? How many... (laughs) Has this ever happened to you where... God has done something in your life, and it just totally took you by surprise. You're like, well, woo, now wait a minute. I wasn't expecting that. But if we stop and think about it, it's the case because remember what Joseph said? Remember what he told his brothers? What you have meant for evil, God has turned around for the good. So sometimes God works against the grain a little bit, thinks outside the box. And sometimes we get ourselves in trouble when we think for him. I believe sometimes God just likes to flip the script on us just to keep us sharp. Does that make sense? That we don't get dull or complacent or just in a rut, so to speak. But he wants to keep us fresh, sharp, seeking him. And so that's why we just don't want to presume that we always know what God's will is. Now, like we said last week, sometimes in the heat of the moment, we'll be required to make a quick decision in this life. How many know sometimes that's the case? And and that's why we need to be full of faith, full of the Word, full of the Holy Spirit. So when those times happen, we're just, boom, led by the Spirit. But then, on the other hand, there are occasions in life when God gives us ample opportunity to pray about something. Especially before we come to a decision. He'll he'll give us time to pray about it. How many know if God has given us time to pray about it, the best thing we can do is pray about it? Not rocket scientists, but, you know, sometimes we miss the little things, don't we? Several years ago, we preached a message entitled, Intimacy Produces Revelation. Intimacy Produces Revelation. When Delilah became intimate with Samson, how many remember the story? When Delilah became intimate with Samson, that is when Samson revealed the secret of his strength. Why is that? Because intimacy produces revelation. Before the apostle John became John the Revelator, I'm going to remember John the Revelator on the Isle of Patmos, the great apostle who gave us the book of Revelation, right? But before the apostle John became John the Revelator, he was first John the Beloved, leaning on Jesus' breast. Hence the fact that intimacy produces revelation. Whenever the other 11 disciples wanted to know something, they just simply asked John. Because if anybody knew Jesus, it was John. Intimacy produces revelation. Another example of this is found in the Old Testament here in Psalms chapter 103. Verse number 7, it says, He made known his ways... To Moses, but only his acts were made known to the children of Israel. Meaning this, the children of Israel saw the effects of God, if you will, 
They, they saw the effects of God from a distance. They saw the fire by night. They saw the pillar of cloud by day. Yet they didn't see, nor did they know, the God of the fire. Nor the God of the cloud. But Moses, on the other hand, Moses not only seen the fire and seen the cloud, but how many know he saw and talked to the God behind them both? <laughs> he was a friend of God. How many are thankful you're a friend of God tonight? Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The children of Israel only knew God's acts, but Moses knew his ways. Meaning that Moses, Moses knew why God did what he did. Amen. Now, before we conclude tonight, I, I want us to kind of change gears here because I don't think we fully understand where this mind of Christ comes from. I thought I did. I thought I was the one responsible in doing that, but now I realize that I need to allow God to renew my mind, that I can't do it by myself, but I've got to submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I've got to make that choice to allow Him to renew my mind. And if I don't, then I'm going to be conformed to the things of this world. But I think sometimes as New Testament, born-again, spirit-filled believers, I think that we think the mind of Christ comes from just being born again, just being full of faith and full of the Word of God and full of the Holy Spirit. And obviously all of those things play a part. All of those things are good. All of those things help. But, but... Let's look at what Paul says here in Philippians chapter 2. As Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. How many remember Paul Harvey? Let's look at the rest of the story here. Let, let, let's see how we can acquire the mind of Christ. Philippians chapter 2, beginning verse number 1. Paul says, therefore, if... There is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy. Fulfill my joy by being what? Like-minded. Now Paul's going to start mentioning the mind a lot right here in these next two verses. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of what? Lowliness of mind. How many see all the minds Paul is mentioning right here? Let each of you look not, out, out not for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind, everybody say, let this mind. In other words, we've got to allow it. We've got to choose. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Wow. So I, I thought I... Sorry, there you go again, presuming. I thought I knew what the mind of Christ was. I thought I knew how I needed to obtain it. But now I realize it's not anything that I can do for myself. 
How many know our righteousness is as filthy rags? So then, Steve cannot renew his own mind. Does that make sense? But I've got to make the choice to allow God to renew it for me. Now, granted, Steve needs to be doing the right things, right? Need to be praying, need to be in the Word, need to be studying, need to be praising, worshiping, going to church, witnessing, sharing my faith. Yeah, I need to be doing all that. But how many know at the end of the day, when everything's said and done, God's still got to do the renewing of my mind for me? What I see in this, what I, something I didn't see before, the renewing of the mind is really a supernatural act. It's a supernatural act. And it doesn't happen necessarily the way we think it does. We don't obtain it the way we, we think we should. But watch this. Let me explain. If you and I, if we want to have the mind of Christ, then obviously we need to think as Jesus thought when he was here on planet earth. Does that make sense? Okay. Well, if that's the case, if we can have the mind of Christ, then what was Jesus like when he was here? What was his mind consumed with? Does anybody have any idea what Jesus' mind might have been consumed with? Ultimately, it was consumed with the cross. But how many know before he got to the cross, he was a servant to all? Right? Remember at the Last Supper, at the Passover, Jesus not only broke bread, broke bread with his disciples, but he also washed their feet. The king, watch this now. We're going to get into this. We're going to break this down. The king of glory, the creator of the universe, became a servant to all. We just missed a good place to shout right there. (laughs) I said he became a servant to all. How many know he even washed Judas' feet? All right. All right. So keep that in mind. So then, as New Testament believers, if we want to obtain, if we want to possess the mind of Christ, then I believe we must seek to have a servant's mentality. The mindset, if you will, of a servant. And for our example, we look no farther than the ultimate servant himself, Jesus Christ. And in doing so, we should adopt the same attitude in which he himself had. Because you see, if anyone deserved to be served, it was the Son of God. It was the King of glory. It was the Ancient of Days. Can anybody say amen? (laughs) Now, let's think about this for a moment. We know that Jesus existed in the form of God. The Bible talks about the fact that he was the express image of the invisible God. But yet, he didn't consider his equality with God as something to be exploited for his own gain or for his own agenda. How many know every... (laughs) Every time Jesus got a chance, he deflected everything to the Father. Think about that. He didn't exploit his position. He didn't try to use it for his own gain or to push his own agenda. But rather, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. Now, we're talking about the mind of Christ, but how do we get there? Because up to this point, 
I had thought, you know, if we just read the Word enough, if we just study enough, if we just pray enough, if we just get full of the Holy Spirit enough, then eventually we can obtain the mind of Christ. Now, all that helps, but I think there's something we're missing, and I think this might have just a little bit to do with it here. Stay with me. So, Jesus emptied himself to become a servant. But there are some things that he did not give up (laughs) in order to do that. We know that Jesus didn't empty himself of his deity because even when he was here on earth, he forgave sins. Remember, that really messed with the religious people, didn't it? How do you have the power to forgive sins? Jesus didn't empty himself of his deity because while he was here on earth, he offered forgiveness for sins. He opened the blinded eyes. He raised the dead. So there wasn't any time that he ever stopped being God. But rather, he took on human flesh and became a servant. He became a ransom for many. He became the redemption package all wrapped up in himself. Can anybody thank God for Jesus tonight and the complete work of the cross? Wow. What an amazing plan, this plan of salvation. Jesus took on human flesh and he became a servant to all. And in doing so, he didn't allow his deity to stop him from expressing his humanity. Like pouring water into a glass, Jesus poured his deity into the container of his humanity. And in doing so, he became fully God. Or no, he was already God. He became fully man while he was still God. (laughs) Let's get it right. Come on, somebody. Think about that. Just like pouring water into a glass, Jesus poured his deity into the container of his humanity. And in doing so, he became fully man while he was still fully God. The crucifixion proved that he was man. But how many know the resurrection proved that he was God? Wow. He was all God, but yet he was all man. He was the God man. In theology, this is known as the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union. Two natures in one person, yet unmixed forever. How could he be all God and all man? I don't know, but I believe it. That's why he was referred to as the Son of Man and the Son of God, right? Mary, his earthly mother, afforded him the opportunity to be the Son of Man, while the Holy Spirit enabled him to be the Son of God. Two natures in one person, yet unmixed forever. You say, well, Steve, what does all this have to do with you and I having the mind of Christ? Well, here it is. Jesus could serve. Jesus could take on the role of a servant because he knew that he was God. There was no identity crisis in the life of Jesus Christ. Serving was not beneath him. Because he knew he was the creator of the earth. Think about it. Service or servanthood was never a threat to Jesus because he never lost sight of who he was. Wow. Jesus was never insecure of his own identity. And even though he didn't empty himself of his deity, 
in his humanity, he became the suffering servant. Wow. Wow. That, my friend, is the true mind of Christ. And the same can be said of you and I here tonight when we know who we are. Does that make sense? Jesus isn't here anymore, but we are. So if Jesus was confident in his own skin, if he could become a servant to all, if he could lay down his life because at the end of the day, he knew he was still God. He knew that he could have called for what? There it is. Thousands of angels to come and save him. But he took on that servanthood. The mind of Christ. And he said, you know what? I'm not here to be served. But I'm here to serve. Wow. Wow. The same needs to be said of you and I here today. When we understand that we are a saint, we're a child of God, then rendering service shouldn't be a problem for us as well. Does that make sense? I mean, if we're really going to be like Jesus, if we're really going to follow his lead and his example then being a servant shouldn't be a problem for us. But you see, it's when we don't know who we are that serving becomes a problem. Did anybody just get that? Let that sink in for just a moment. It's when we don't know who we are that serving becomes a problem. When we're unsure of our identity, then we'll fear that serving is somehow beneath us. Mm. That somehow we'll be taken advantage of if we serve. Wow. Wow. But how many know if you really know who you are? You can wash anybody's feet, including the feet of your betrayer. Ah, come on. Come on. Is anybody getting this? Come on. You got to get a hold of it. We're talking about the mind of Christ. What did Jesus think like when he was here? How did he act? How did he talk? How did he con conduct himself? That all has to do with the mind of Christ. See, as New Testament spirit-filled believers, oh, we think the mind of Christ is just this woo, powerful, anointed thing. You know, I'm speaking and preaching and teaching life and, uh, you know, prophesying and decreeing and declaring and all those things are great. But what about the other side of the coin? The humility, the brokenness, the servanthood, the stillness, the quiet. <laughs> wow. Wow. Anybody getting anything out of this? I know when it hit me, I was like, Ooh, Lord Jesus, help me. <laughs> when we understand our true identity, then serving won't be a problem for us. My last scripture, let's turn to Matthew. Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. Yet it shall not be so among you. Look at your neighbor and tell him he's speaking to us. <laughs> but whoever desires to become great among you 
Let him be your what? Servant. How many know that's just opposite of what would we th- would think in the natural? That's why he spoke through Isaiah and said his ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Verse 27. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your what? Slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Now listen, this all goes back to last week's message when Paul implores us to offer our life as a living sacrifice. Paul could say that because Jesus was the example and Jesus offered his life not only as a sacrifice but a ransom for many. So then, there's a couple of different ways that we can look at this. When we realize who we are in Christ... We can either think that we're high and mighty and holy and anointed (laughs) and called to rule and reign in Christ, which we are, which we are, but that's more in a spiritual setting. But can I tell you, in the natural, we are called to humbly serve. I think today what we need more than anything is a church who will serve not only each other, but will serve at work, at a home, at school, in the community they're in. And if we learn to do that, I believe we can reach people that God wants us to reach. How many believe we live in a world that wants to see the goods? Not just what we say. Not just what we profess. Not just what we confess. But what we possess. Amen? And so this is where I believe the mind of Christ comes into play. When we realize who we are in Christ, that you know what? We don't have anything to prove. We don't have to go go out and show ourselves off and say, hey, look at me. I can do this. I can do that. I'm a child of God. No, what we need to be is just humble Lowly servants. Servants. And as we learn to submit ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and as we allow the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Word, the confession of our faith, as we allow all these things to start transforming us, God comes along and says, Thank you very much. You're giving me something to work with here. Let me do the rest for you. How many know God wants to do all the heavy lifting in our lives? You say, well, Steve, what do you mean by that? Well, it's kind of like this verse. Unless God builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. How many know God's got to do this work? God's got to do it. So as we allow these things to happen in our lives, I believe God uses all of them to transform us. And it allows us to possess the very mind 
of Christ. I know that's a powerful statement, but I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. How many believe you can have the mind of Christ? You say, well, Steve, how do you, how do you think that? How do you believe? Because the word says we can. Now, we don't do that for our own good. I don't seek to, to have the mind of Christ to, to build steveowensministries.com. Just as Jesus didn't misuse his identity and his identity to propagate his own agenda, but the will of the Father, what did he say in the garden? He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Oh, that was the humanity of Jesus crying out. But thank God he didn't stop there. He said, but nevertheless, not my will, not my human will. Come on, somebody. Not the carnal nature, not the sin nature. Now, Jesus didn't have to say that because he didn't have any sin in him. But how many know that's what we need to say? Not my will, Lord. But thine be done. And when we do that, when we come to that place of submission, when we come, and this is how verse 1 and 2 ties all together, if you go back to Romans chapter 12, this is how we can present our body as a living sacrifice. When we allow God to renew our mind. And when we allow God to renew our mind, guess what? We're going to be transformed. We're going to be changed. We're going to be edified. We're going to be built up. But we've got to allow him to do that. How many know sometimes as humans we're our own worst enemy? Don't raise your hand right now. <laughs> Pastor Tom, I hate to say it. I know you love Barney. Barney. But we're like Barney Five. We kind of shoot ourselves in the foot. And that's why Andy had to take his bullets from him. <laughs> I want to know sometimes God has to take our bullets from us because we keep shooting ourselves in the foot. But how many believe we can reach a place of growth in God? Woo, Jesus, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. How many believe we can reach a place in Jesus? And I understand it's not going to happen overnight. But if we'll stick with the plan, if we'll stick with the process, if we'll allow God to work on us, if we'll allow the Holy Spirit to move on us, if we won't give up, if we'll stay faithful, if we'll stay in the Word, come on, somebody. Woo! If we'll just keep going on and going on and doing what we know to do. I believe we can come in possession of that mind of Christ. And yeah, will end up doing great things. They that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. But you know what? What I'm seeing out of this lesson that I've never saw before is the greatest things wasn't the miracles, wasn't the healings, wasn't the signs and wonders. But the greatest thing about Jesus was the fact that he knelt before Judas, knowing that Judas was going to betray him. But yet he poured the water and he washed his feet. Oh, he washed his feet. And my friend, Judas knew. Because after he betrayed Jesus, how many remember the movie, The Passion of the Christ? You remember the scene where Judas takes back the 30 pieces of silver and he throws them at the Pharisees and the Sadducees? Judas knew. And I don't know, was, was there something in, in Judas's heart where 
He thought maybe that Jesus would show himself as God. Maybe he thought Jesus, Jesus needed a little push, a little shove. I don't know. I'm overthinking this, I know, but Judas knew. That's why he went out and hung himself because he knew he betrayed an innocent man. Church, can I tell you, this is what I believe after going through this study before we can ever possess the mind of Christ. We've got to become humble like a servant. And we have to love people. Pastor Tom, we were talking about it Tuesday morning. We've got to feed his sheep. We've got to feed his sheep. If you love me, do you love me, Peter? Feed my sheep. Oh, I know the signs and wonders are great. I know the healings and miracles are needed. But the greatest thing you can do is just love one another. Minister one to another. And that, my friend, I believe, is the true mind of Christ. Let's stand together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. When I started this Bible study Sunday night, I had no idea what it was going to lead to. I started in the first part of the lesson, and I thought I understood where I was going. But it was a moment in time when I stopped right there at my study, and I remembered some of the words that Sister Jody had spoke just that morning. Are we willing? Are we available? <laughs> and the Lord just began to download this into my spirit, man. And I don't know about you, but it just amazes me how I think I know some things until God proves to me that I don't hardly know anything. But we are constantly learning. It grow. And in the process of that, we're becoming more and more like Jesus. And in that intimacy, that's where revelation will come. Out of that intimacy, that relationship, that's where revelation will come. And I'm so thankful that we serve a God that is so much bigger than us that we cannot exhaust. That just about the time we think we've got a handle on everything, he blows us away with so much more. How many are thankful that's the kind of God that you serve tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Pastor Tom, why don't you come and pray us out tonight? Name somebody in this church that is one of the biggest workers, givers, servant to this body. Anybody throw out a name? How about Jody Duncan? I'm going to surprise you about something. Somebody let me know. Did you know she has her master's degree? How many people knew that? Huh? One, two, three, four. Four people out of all of us. And five, me. Yeah, but she's too intelligent to serve like that. She's one of the biggest servants around here. Man, she did the dance. She pro did all these programs. I finally found out, oh, maybe a month ago, she has her master's degree. 
Yeah. She never touted it. Father, thank you for the Lord, those who really have a heart of servantship. That Lord, as I, Pastor C said, we, Tuesday morning we were here. And this is exactly what we spoke about. Of being a son of God. I, I am a son of God. But I'm a son of God who serves God's people. And Lord, those who serve the most. Yes, Lord, those who serve the most. Yeah, I wrote it down. I can't remember exactly what I said on there. But Lord, those who know who they are serve the most, Lord. Yeah, I know I'm a son of God, but that doesn't get in my way of serving. Because, Lord, <laughs> Jesus, I think about you. As Pastor Steve mentioned, John chapter 13, you as God Almighty kneeled down and you washed yes. Judas's feet. You didn't love Judas any less than you did the other 11 disciples. You loved him equally. So your love wasn't conditioned. Your, your, their attitude and their rejection of you, his rejection of you, didn't affect your servanthood to him. Oh, God, what a great lesson to learn. Mm. Yes, those who love the most serve the most. Thank you, Lord, for your example. Lord, you did it, which means I can do it through you. Lord, I thank you. Lord, may this be ministered into our mind. May we always think, Lord, how can I serve? In Jesus' name, amen.